Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I want to welcome you to, to the third in the law school series on diversity in American legal um, history. Uh, today's uh, presentation is going to be by Professor John uh, S.W. Park of the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he is a professor of Asian American Studies and chair of the Asian American Studies Department. Uh, Professor Park uh, got his undergraduate degree at Berkeley and then came uh, to Harvard for the Kennedy School and then returned to Berkeley to get his uh, um, Juris, doctorate of jurisprudence at the law school uh, there. Um, and he's been uh, teaching at Santa Barbara for the past uh, 14 years or so. Uh, a few years ago, he published a book uh, with the title uh, Illegal, Illegal Migrations and the Huckleberry Finn Problem. Uh, and I asked him uh, before the session uh, what the Huckleberry Finn problem was, and he said, well, he was actually going to open the discussion today with uh, a, a description of what the problem was. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn the podium over to Professor Park uh, and uh, hope that you'll uh, find his lecture interesting. We hope to have time for questions and answers afterwards. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, first of all, it's, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, to Professor Tushnet, uh, to Dean uh, Minow, uh, and then to Ms. Ellis uh, for making all of the arrangements. Yeah, uh, really, it's, uh, it's been about 20 years since I've been back in the building. I don't think this building existed, so I was uh, quite lost this morning. Uh, um, yeah, uh, the presentation that I'm uh, doing today is Part of that's that's the book uh, that Professor Teshnet mentioned. It's the second part of a uh, very large project. The first part of it, and you know, to introduce the Huckleberry Finn problem. The Huckleberry Finn problem is essentially if you meet someone who's out of status, yeah, would you tell? Yeah. Uh, the question arises uh, exactly in my own work. You know, I teach at UC Santa Barbara. I think every year. Uh, we matriculate about 100 uh, to 200 students who are uh, not legally entitled to be in the United States, right? They're illegal immigrant students. Uh, oftentimes, they tell me that uh, in the fall term uh, when I'm in my office hours. <clears throat> and sometimes they tell me in a weird way, like they're confessing or something, right? So I grew up Catholic. Uh, and sometimes the students ask me to close the door, and then they tell me that they have this problem. Yeah. Uh, I've argued in this book that instead of a, a novel kind of problem, that this is a recurring problem, that many American citizens uh, throughout American history, uh, when they've encountered people who uh, are out of place and are not in the, the right spot, um, they have a problem. And that uh, many American citizens often, like Huckleberry Finn himself, they don't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, the second part of the proposal, or the, the project, and the part that I'm presenting to you, and by the way, I've organized a presentation to be just about a half hour, largely because I'm mostly interested in your responses uh, to this work, and your take on it, and to, to field these questions. Yeah. Uh, the second part of the book, uh, or the project, looks at the subjective experiences of people, especially young people, who come into an awareness that they have an illegal immigration or illegal migration problem. Yeah. Uh, the method, <coughs> in terms of um, the kind of evidence that I've used, I, I primarily work in archival legal history. So I've been looking at um, 19th and early 20th century uh, US materials looking at uh, stories about fugitive slaves and fugitive slave families. Yeah. Uh, I've a lot of the research that I've been doing this past week here at Harvard uh, has been about uh, Native Americans and Native American children, yeah, uh, who in the late 19th century uh, were told in very institutional settings that they uh, that there was something wrong with their parents, uh, that there was something wrong with them, uh, that they needed to be folded into American citizenship. But that often did mean uh, giving up aspects of their self and their identity. And then the last third of the project uh, concerns uh, 
Asian Americans uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, after the Chinese Exclusion Act, Asians were not supposed to come to the United States. Yeah? Uh, and yet, despite the prohibitions, including the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, uh, hundreds and then thousands of Asians came unlawfully. Yeah. Uh, the curious thing about that is that many of them had children. Uh, and sometimes uh, the children didn't find out uh, that their parents were illegal immigrants until a little later, right? Uh, until they were about your age. Again, the archival history, the project overall, is designed to foreground a legal history that helps us understand our own contemporary dilemmas when we encounter and experience people uh, who have unlawful status. And you know, I invited uh, Professor Gonzalez. There's Professor Gonzalez there. <laughs> He's at the Harvard Ed School. Uh, his ethnographic work, uh, Lacey Abrego's, uh, Professor Abrego teaches at UCLA. Uh, their ethnographic work on undocumented students and undocumented young people is quite inspirational right, and influential uh, in shaping my own work uh, in archival legal history. Yeah. And again, uh, a lot of the subjective experiences of coming out of status, of learning that you have this problem, I think in ethnographic sociology, in American society and culture in general, we might be prone to thinking that that is, again, a new problem. But this is, uh, provides a, a historical context for understanding that. Yeah. And, oh, have I been? Uh, there we go. Yeah, uh, that's the method. OK, so yeah, I'm about halfway through all of the archival collection. I still have a fair amount to go. And then there's the brutal writing process that will <laughs> take forever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're still in a, a place where I think uh, I can still shape some of the themes. And I hope you'll help me. OK. So in terms of the first part where the data collection is more uh, fleshed out and more complete, right? Uh, I've looked at uh, fugitive slave families. Right? And fugitive slave families are, are very interesting. They're very, um, uh, because as you know, uh, during the period when slavery was legal, lots of African-American slaves fled from the South. They migrated to the North. Many of them settled in the Midwest. Yeah? Many fugitive slaves uh, formed families in the wake of that. Yeah. Again, uh, I come at this from the direction of immigration law and immigration history. And one of the terms among uh, immigration scholars is the mixed status family. Right? The mixed status family is one member of the family is an American citizen. Other member of the family is not. Uh, someone, sometimes uh, mom or dad are legal immigrants. Oftentimes they are not. Yeah. Uh, it actually turns out that mixed status families among African American families in the Midwest and in the Northeast, even in places like Boston, it's really common. Yeah. So mom or dad or both flee from the South. Yeah. Uh, they come and settle in the North, and then they have children. Yeah. The big question in, in American legal history, what is the status of the children? Yeah. Uh, if they were born in a free state, are they free? Yeah, uh, many Southerners argued that the children, especially the ones that were born to mothers of slaves, uh, they were property. Yeah, uh, they should be removed back with their parents back into slavery. Yeah, again, imagine that problem and almost the existential terror of experiencing that problem, growing up and finding out when you're 12 or 13 that you, your mother or your father, yeah, uh, could all be removed back to the South uh, as someone else's property. Yeah. Uh, some of the archival work that I've collected in this section is just so rich. Yeah. <laughs> the varieties of experience are so rich. And the thing about it is there's no single response to that condition. So some African American children, um, and I guess some of the historical context is important. Many African Americans who ran to the North or ran to the, uh, the Midwest Many of them were light-skinned. Yeah, I show you this postcard uh, because it's a postcard dated uh, from the late 19th century, but it's designed to show black slaves. Yeah. But the message underlying the postcard is sometimes you can't tell. <laughs> Just by looking at someone, you really couldn't tell whether they were a black slave or a, white, a dark-skinned white person. 
Yeah. Uh, among the children of fugitive slave families, right, in the North and in the Midwest, many of them were and did pass as white. Yeah. One response to uh, coming into an awareness that you are the son or daughter of the fugitive slave was to hide that identity. It was to pass into whiteness. Yeah. Uh, in many ways, that also involved distancing between yourself and your parents. It involved an additional migration where you could relocate and make yourself anew. Yeah. I think that's very striking. <laughs> That's, I think, some of what um, Roberto's informants either want to do or kind of like have in the back of their mind to do. Yeah. On the other end of things, there are lots of young people who come into an awareness that they have this problem, and they become some of the most important abolitionists of the period. Right. So, the picture you see on your left is the Scott family. Uh, that's Mr. Langston, uh, Charles Langston, uh, in the middle. And that's Rosetta Douglas on the right. Rosetta Douglas is the daughter of Frederick Douglas, the great abolitionist. Uh, and she herself, um, she herself and her mother, they all became very staunch abolitionists, as, as did Charles Langston. Uh, again, they realize right, that because mom and dad have had this condition, because this is a legal status that uh, utterly disables them, yeah. The only way out of it is to abolish the existence of the status itself. Yeah. And some of the, uh, the strongest advocates for abolition turn out to be the sons and daughters of fugitive slaves. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm just so enamored of all of these materials. You know, I mean, I, I just uh, uh, having collected a lot of this archival work for uh, so long, I'm both saddened and amazed how this history can speak to us, right? And how it can help us understand uh, some of the more complex migration problems that we're facing in the United States, yeah? And also, you know, the project is designed to show a kind of progress in history, or at least a, a theme in history, yeah? How American public law often has this recurring tendency to create the very conditions where young people uh, come to, um, feel as though that there's something wrong with them uh, and their parents. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah the uh, second part of the project concerns Native Americans and Native American boarding schools. And again, this may require some historical context that not all of you have. So after the American Civil War, uh, the United States Army uh, simply turns west, <laughs> almost pivots. So you know, I taught for a while uh, at the University of Texas, and I refer to the Civil War and one of my students stopped me and said that in Texas, we don't call it the Civil War. Uh, we call it the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> and that's, you know, I guess that's what it was in Texas. The War of, uh, the war of Northern Aggression, uh, really after 1965, it really pivots. Uh, in many ways, the federal armies, once they occupy the South, yeah, they turn west uh, and really, after 1870, and for the next 15 years, federal troops will eventually subjugate all Native American tribes west of the Mississippi River, right, to the point where um, the Navajo, the, the, the Sioux, uh, these massive, uh, the Comanche, these massive tribes are put under federal supervision. You know, I think if you've been taking Professor Teshin's seminar, you've um, at least become familiar with some of that history. One aspect of the policy in the 1880s, especially after the Dawes Act, was to take Native American children, many of whom were orphaned during the period of warfare itself, yeah. and then to send them hundreds of miles uh, to boarding schools. And these boarding schools were often run by churches. They were often run by missionary organizations. And it was in these settings where these children were taught not to speak their native language. Yeah. Uh, they were taught to give up their native religion. Uh, they were told to speak English uh, and given Native American clothes or uh, given American, uh, Western American clothes. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about it is at the time, uh, this was thought to be the more progressive solution. <laughs> the more right-wing solution was just to liquidate or, or destroy uh, Native Americans. This other solution was to try to recover the children yeah, through this uh, system of forced assimilation. 
again, uh, looking at that archival history, looking at the stories left behind of these children, uh, and many of them, again, are very jarring. You know, these are young people who, from a very early age, sometimes as young as eight or nine, were told that there was something wrong with them, uh, that they represented or they embodied a culture that had to pass. <coughs> Yeah, uh, and they that some they themselves had to pass into whiteness. Yeah, uh, and in many instances, their Native American identities were often beaten out of them. Yeah, again, uh, coming into an awareness of your um, your very vulnerable predicament uh, in American public law, your very vulnerable position in American public law. Uh, the one thing that uh, these children uh, almost all had in common is they went for very, very long periods of time without seeing their parents. Yeah. Uh, and then when they revisited their parents, they realized that fun they were fundamentally different. Right. The education that they experienced in boarding school, and the literacy, uh, the learning of white man's ways, it made them uh, very different. Again, my uh, colleagues in Native American history and Native American studies, they've argued that this was a practice essentially of a kind of cultural genocide, right? So of, of uh, taking a full generation of people within an oral tradition you know, and just sort of wiping it out. You know? um, these stories have been really, really fascinating. You know? One byproduct, though, of this boarding school experience, and this is something that uh, I'm continuing to work on, uh, is that uh, many of these uh, students went into the boarding schools very different and very distinct, right? They went in as Apache. They went in as Navajo. They went in as uh, members of the Ohlone tribe. Yeah. However, uh, the assimilationist institutionalized structure in which they lived uh, created an identity where at the end of the boarding school experiences, they were more inclined to think of themselves as Native American. You know what I mean? That despite their tribal distances, yeah, and despite their distinct tribal identities, at least the ones who left records behind, they did think of themselves as having something politically and culturally in common yeah, that superseded their tribal identities. Again, going back to the discussion of undocumented youth and um, the activism uh, among many of the dreamers and of uh, many of the young people who are coming out of status but who are becoming more politically active. That's a very striking theme, right? So, you know, a lot of the college age students who engage in the movement, they're from Guatemala, they're from Honduras, they're from Mexico, uh, some of them are from China, uh, some of them are from South Korea. Uh, by participating in the movement, right? Uh, by coming into consciousness, uh, often on a university campus, yeah. Uh, they often overcome uh, whatever ethnic or uh, geographic distance that they may have had, right, uh, to develop a collective identity, yeah, uh, and to think uh, that they have more in common than not. Uh, that's been very striking to see, at least uh, in this part of the piece. Okay. I can't believe it. I'm like on time. You know, for an academic, that's very challenging. You know? I mean, that's like a, really. Uh, the last part of the piece um, is the Asian uh, American history and the uh, Asian exclusion period, right? And in this period, we look at, or I look at, uh, how second generation Chinese Americans coped with uh, and responded to the condition of their parents, uh, many of whom were illegal immigrants to the United States, yeah? And often how they themselves discovered uh, these kinds of things. Yeah, and this part of Asian American history, okay, so this is the part where I think uh, I've done a lot of archival work uh, in the past on this, right? So, you know, um, I'm an Asian Americanist, and this is, uh, I've done this for a long, long time. But yeah, I mean, some of this stuff is just, again, quite fascinating, right? Uh, it's quite fascinating in the sense that many uh, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans do attempt to distance themselves from their family. So they insist that because I'm an American-born citizen, Right? And by the way, thanks to the 14th Amendment, Chinese persons who are born in the United States are American. They're native-born American citizens. Yeah. But imagine the tension between an American-born uh, American citizen, right, who's about 14 or 15, discovering that mom or dad or both are illegal immigrants. Yeah. Uh, do you tell? What do you do? <laughs> yeah. Again, what's been striking about so much of the work is the range of responses. 
right? So some of the Asian kids, uh, uh, they run the other way. <laughs> they move away. They don't want to associate with their, their parents. Uh, they often become very ashamed. So, and this is something that I think in ethnic studies or in Asian American studies, uh, we have, at least um, in the early histories of it, uh, we've not been as open about. Right. The extent to which when a group of people is faced with immigration exclusion and then race-based exclusion, yeah, and many of the Asian Americans uh, suffered racial segregation, you know, I mean, uh, they suffered uh, discrimination in the labor markets, all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, in the withering light of white supremacy, many Asian Americans, especially the young people, especially the ones that are very impressionable, they just don't want to have anything to do with Asians. <laughs> Uh, with Asian communities, they just, they just want to move. They want, uh, and they often uh, leave records of how they do feel or felt very ashamed uh, that their parents migrated unlawfully, and they felt that there was something kind of wrong with them. Yeah, uh, that's very true in a lot of the families that I uncover. So uh, again, because I work in legal history, the <clears throat> the family on the top, uh, those are the tapes, right? Uh, they are the uh, the protagonists and one of the most important cases of race-based segregation uh, in public education in California. Yeah. The family on the bottom, those are the Lums. They're the you know, Gong Lum v. Rice, the very famous case from Mississippi, uh, again, uh, regarding education. But what's interesting is if you look at the family records of both, you do see a lot of uh, the kids growing up feeling kind of um, You know, I've, I've been wondering about that. So I have three teenage girls myself. Uh, they are often embarrassed about that. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's kind of like a phase that we all go through. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe I'm, um, However, that uh, I think a lot of the shame or uh, wanting to distance yourself from your families, at least in these instances, is coded with public law. <laughs> it's largely layered uh, through the idea that, you know, your illegal immigrant parents, they cannot legally own land. They can't legally find certain kinds of work. Yeah, they are treated as public pariahs. Yeah. And many young people in that very impressionable age um, don't really respond well to that. Yeah. And you see that definitely um, during internment. So the second part of the, I guess the second part of the third part of the project deals with Japanese American internment. And again, the range of responses. So what happens when uh, federal officials uh, declare your entire community a group of enemy aliens? And then all of a sudden, a status or a position that you enjoy just is no protection against the locomotive of the federal, the federal government uh, moving to incarcerate you. Yeah. Again, the responses of the young people that I've studied in this era is very striking. Many of them are quite heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, they go toward you know, the range of responses of some Japanese Americans, and again, you know, I usually move around in a lecture, but I think you're recording, yeah, so I'll just have to stay here. <clears throat> yeah, uh, in some instances, Japanese Americans, especially in the second generation, they actually work with federal officials and even go so far as to say, yes, the first generation Japanese Americans, you should incarcerate them. <laughs> They're disloyal. Uh, many of them haven't converted to Christianity. Uh, they keep robust ties to the Japanese empire. Right. Those Japanese immigrants uh, you should take away and incarcerate. Yeah. Uh, other Japanese Americans uh, argue that this is just, you know, just unconstitutional. It's wrong. <laughs> that uh, there's nothing wrong with my parents. There's nothing wrong with us. Uh, what the American government doing is doing is just completely horrible. Yeah. And again, uh, looking at the. Uh, um, the way in which people respond, I think, to instances of, of white supremacy and yeah, and the full brunt of public law is what makes this uh, topic so uh, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, really, that's the broad outline of the project. And really, again, uh, this is in many ways a lot of the work uh, about young people coming into it. You know, the upshot of it is uh, when young people uh, Try to get a driver's license. Try to go to college. Um, try to do things with and for their parents. 
you know, uh, when they discover that they or their parents or everybody in the family, they have a legal status problem, you know, uh, what I'm trying to show is that this is not a new thing, you know, uh, that this is a recurring tendency in American public law. You know, uh, it's a very interesting and very sad uh, way in which uh, American law tends to create illegal people you know, uh, and causes all kinds of pain and suffering and misery and, in some sense, uh, anxiety. I mean, the one thing that all of these different strands or these different histories have in common is the fear, the very real fear, of sudden, irreparable, and long-distance family separation. You know? Uh, the possibility, a very distinct possibility, that your family will be shattered, yeah, uh, and that public officials will take one, both, everyone, and move them uh, against their will. Yeah, uh, this is, I think, what uh, makes our contemporary debate so. I mean, I just think they're really quite awful. <laughs> you know, uh, even as we are in this election cycle, uh, even as immigration has become such a, um, a hot topic, yeah. Uh, try to imagine, at least for a moment, you know, the, the one thing I learned uh, in graduate school, uh, one thing that many of my uh, uh, professors taught me is that history is best when you take an empathetic perspective, yeah? when you are able to put yourself in the position of other actors, yeah? uh, literally become uh, uh, not self-absorbed and literally like, be able to put yourself in another person's perspective. Yeah? Imagine for a moment listening to the presidential debates nowadays and being someone who's out of status. Yeah. Here, American citizens are debating your fate and the fate of your family, and you don't get to vote. <laughs> you don't have a say in the political process. Yeah. Uh, you are completely disabled in the law. Yeah. I mean, in that way, uh, contemporary groups of undocumented persons in the United States share a great deal in common with these other people uh, in American history. Yeah. And that history, I think, can tell us a great deal about, you know, this has a double meaning. The coming into an awareness does have a very double meaning. And on the one hand, it means young people coming into an awareness of their status-based problems. And stuff. But it's also how we come into an awareness of these problems. Yeah, I think we're living through yet another moment in American history where we have to admit to ourselves uh, that our legal problem, it's not these children or these young people who are the problem. It's perhaps our public law. Yeah, uh, It's the way we uh, and our public law deal with these kinds of issues. That's what's bad uh, or needs reform. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, what the history is, is trying to show, right? or at least it's situating it in that way. Now, I have some other slides, but I think I'll stop. I mean, that's, it's been about a half hour. It's even earlier. And uh, I'll take your questions. And I'm, I'm really very interested in, in your reactions to the work um, and in getting your insights about um, what this all means. OK. <laughs> OK, so Miss Ellis tells me that there's a microphone, right? So if you have a, a question. Thank you. Uh, my question is about, um, I was wondering if you had looked at the relation maybe between children of uh, illegal or undocumented, however you describe them, immigrants versus the children of um, maybe their peers who have were the children of like legal or documented immigrants or something like the children of runaway slaves versus the children of free blacks? Like, mm -hmm. Is there a lot of tension between those two communities? Yes, or? yes there are. And in fact, uh, in the free black communities in the north, wait, it's this slide. In the free black communities in the north, especially in Boston, some of the older generations of African Americans who were emancipated shortly after the American Revolution, they were not all that receptive to the arrival of fugitive slaves. In fact, some of them were not helpful at all. Right? And I think uh, part of that was driven by wanting to distance themselves from these fugitive slaves yeah, uh, and thinking that uh, the presence or arrival of large numbers of fugitive slaves would erode their own position. 
Yeah. So yes, there is there is definitely that. There there is a great deal of disagreement. Even, so even among Asian Americans, right? So Asian Americans who had legal status were born in the United States. They did uh, very profoundly uh, attempt to distance themselves from newer. I mean, I think some of this, you know, those of you in the room might actually have some personal experience. So if you're an Asian American, if you speak fluent English and so on, I mean, to what extent do you, are you comfortable around FOBs? <laughs> you know, people who just, just arrive and you're like, oh, you know, no, 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 I'm Asian American. I'm not like this, this Chinese tourist. You know, I mean, like that there is that kind of like a distancing that occurs uh, that, that's uh, pretty common. And that's a common theme that I do see in a lot of the archival work. Yeah. There's a question there. Um, I have a pretty similar question. So you said that some of the um, undocumented children, some of them kind of wanted to pass more as white, and then others became activists. Um, did you see any um, differences in maybe where those children were, or what prompted them to um, be different in that way? You know, maybe mm -hmm. they were kind of part of an environment that was um, more where they could gather with other students and kind of have that consciousness or? You know who I would ask? Mm -hmm. I would ask Professor Gonzalez. <laughs> because, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's well, uh, he's the ethnographic sociologist. I'm the archival. I don't really talk to living people, right? So I, I mostly look at archival work. And I think your ethnography is just uh, far richer in that question. <laughs> So you're asking me a question based on his theory. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with you. I, I don't want to steal the spotlight here. Well, I mean, like one minute. <laughs> so, so in my research, um, just, just to set context, um, I followed 150 undocumented young adults for 12 years. Um, young people all... Uh, of whom came to the U.S. before the age of 12. Um, and so what some of what Professor Park spoke of, um, I found that as young people hit these critical stages at around 14, 15, 16 years old, as friends are getting driver's licenses, taking summer jobs or after-school jobs, registering to vote, thinking about college, getting financial aid for colleges, friends are moving forward. Friends that, that undocumented young people grow up with, right? As friends are moving forward, they have no choice but just to stay in one place. Um, and it's a, it's a really, it's a very dramatic, very, very dramatic and chaotic experience. Um, you think about adolescents and how kind of vulnerable adolescents are. Um, so layer on all of these these things of exclusion, but also stigma. And I think that stigma is part of what you're getting at. And, mm -hmm. and, the stig and, and I think that it's really kind of central in your question. So just as many, as you describe, um, as many young people may not know about their status, or at least don't know exactly what it's going to mean for them as they grow up, um, this is also not something that they're talking about. They don't talk about on the playground with their friends. Mm -hmm. Many of their friends, many of the young people that I met, kept this a secret from from friends, from romantic partners into their twenties, mm -hmm. from teachers, from counselors, etc. Um, and so, stigma management then becomes what I call a, a secondary border that reinforces legal exclusions, right? And so, what does it mean to keep a secret? So what, is, what does it mean to live in That's Los right. Angeles and you're taking the bus because you can't drive? Living in Boston is fine if you can't take the bus, but if you live in a rural area, or if you live in a rural, a rural area or a metropol uh, sp sprawling metropolis like Los Angeles, um, getting seven miles you know, is upward of, uh, upwards of two hours or more in public transportation than two or three transfers. Mm -hmm. And so in keeping this secret, why, um, why a salutatorian is not going to college, uh, why this young promising um, individual had to turn down a, a dream job offer, um, you know, again, why they're taking the bus, I think that for many people, um, this act of, of concealment ends up 
um, creating other problems and, and ends up separating them, I think, from, from kind of key supports, friendship networks, teachers, um, other adult help, et cetera. Um, I think that what, and then I'll, I'll this, is, this is the academic thing, so I didn't want to talk, but then I'm going to talk for like 10 minutes. Uh, so I think, so the third part of this is that I, I think the, your question, I think that a lot of young people over the last like five or so years have found empowerment in coming out and being active. So what does it mean then to be bottled up and keep a secret for a long time is that you're swallowing a lot of stuff and it's really stressful um, and it, it really, it's very challenging to one's mental health. Uh, what I found is that a lot of young people who are out and who are activists no longer have to keep these secrets, um, are able to disclose, are able then not to hide their identity, not to hide who they are, uh, and moreover, find company in um, young people who, young peers who are going through the same kinds of th experiences. And so that's been, I think, really liberating for a lot of young people. Um, I'm not sure about the whiteness aspect of, of this, and I, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much I, I'm not sure how, how, how strongly you stated that. And I'm not sure how much I agree, but that's, that's certainly up, up for debate. I don't know that people are either kind of activists or out or they're, they're kind of white, um, because I think that there's a lot of, yeah, it's uh, really complicated. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the final point is that a lot of people, most of the young people that I met who are out are only out in, in, in certain um, spaces in their lives. And that is that uh, they're... Uh, the kind of concealment, reveal, conceal, reveal dynamic in their lives is segmented. Mm -hmm. um, I know many activists, for example, on this Harvard campus, um, several took my class a few years ago, and we're not out, uh, they're, so they're out publicly, but we're not out in a classroom, for example, in an immigration class where we're, we're talking about some of these issues. So I think that this is, it's a, not a kind of positive linear process um, rather, it's segment and, and really kind of um, contingent upon on space and place. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's all. You know, again, looking at the archival history, you find a lot of that, a lot of concealment. So among a lot of my own students who are out of status, it's around holidays when they travel back and forth. They would never <laughs> tell anyone there's out. So the campus has become a kind of safe space. Right, and certain portions of the campus, but the rest of their lives, not so. Yeah, and you see that in the archival uh, work as well. Yeah, and the one thing, I mean, uh, answering that question through the archival work, this is one of my favorite people uh, that I've encountered through the work. This is Gertrude Bonin. Uh, she is a Dakota Sioux, and at least. You know, I didn't mean to do this when I started the archive, but I noticed that many of the activists, the people who became the abolitionists, the people who uh, spoke against Native American boarding schools, the people who spoke against internment, uh, the one thing that they had in common was uh, education. Yeah, and a unique kind of education. So, you know, Gertrude Bonin, she did have something of a formal education, and she went to Earlham College and. Um, in Indiana, and then she studied music, uh, and then she became a writer, right? And then writing, uh, and writing about herself uh, became like the most important form of education for her. Yeah? Through her writing, through the uh, experience of writing about what it felt like to be a young girl of eight years old, taken from uh, the reservation, put into a boarding school, and then getting this education. I mean, the one uh, dominant theme is a kind of ambivalence. On the one hand, she does feel that what happened to her and children like her, that was horrible, right? To be separated from your family, not to have a choice in the matter, right? And then to be shipped away, that was horrible. On the other hand, she really enjoyed reading and writing. She really enjoyed being a literate person. Yeah. It gave her the tools to understand what had happened to her uh, and to her family. Uh, and that later, uh, those skills helped her become a much better critic of the entire uh, uh, federal uh, policies toward Native Americans. Yeah. 
that kind of education as a liberatory thing you know, that helps you uh, become free of this very stigma that's caused by law. Yeah. That, I think, is a fascinating. And a lot of the things that she wrote, I think, are just, uh, I, I like her work just because it's so vibrant. right? So she describes herself as an apple. Now, she's writing that she's an apple when she's about my age and describing herself in her 20s. And by, by the apple metaphor, she says she's, she's an apple because she's red on the outside. She's an Indian Native American woman. And so she's red on the outside. But she was becoming white on the inside. I think if any of you are in the room who've ever felt like you were a banana, an Oreo, <laughs> a coconut, uh, you would kind of understand what that metaphor captures, right? Uh, and it was something about that education, right? It had, it had this um, a critical capacity not just to understand the self, but to understand the larger political and legal world upon which these things happened to her and to people like her. Yeah. The other person that I, so this is Professor Catano. Uh, he taught at UCLA for many years. Uh, many of his earlier personal archives are stored away in the UCLA and the Japanese American National Museum. And again, you know, when he was a younger man, his family was interned. Yeah. Uh, and it took him a long time to become an academic. Yeah. Uh, and he describes those early years as a, a period of great confusion. He didn't know what he was. Uh, he just knew that his family had been incarcerated. Uh, they must have done something wrong. Uh, he attempted to put some distance between himself and his family. He picked up jazz. That's what the, right? I think he kind of wanted to be black. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, it wasn't just, you know, I, and I agree. It's not a, a linear thing. It's not a progressive thing. It's not like, you know, uh, you're either embracing this identity or you're wanting to be white. I think. You can want to be other things. right? Uh, if you don't like what you are, you attempt to be something else. Yeah. And he did that for a long, long time. But again, uh, as a college student uh, and then as a graduate student in Berkeley, the one critical thing was that education part. Yeah. He started taking half the studies, man. I mean, and, and sort of blew his mind. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, again, he comes to a more circular position where he realized that what had happened to him and to his family was just wrong. Right? As professor uh, at UCLA, uh, as one of the first pioneering scholars in Asian American studies, he was very active in the redress movement. Right? Getting your government to apologize for what it did to you and to your family. Yeah. That, I think, is the liberatory power. And you know, as much as this work is often quite dark, you know, um, my own archival work I don't know whether you experience this, but sometimes it depresses me. <laughs> you kind of like, you know, you look through these journals and things. It's very, very sad. But uh, sometimes there is a silver lining. There is sometimes a kind of glimmer of hope uh, that these things can become better, yeah, and that we can uh, uh, move beyond uh, the morass that that our own legal system tends to create. Yeah. Yes. Oh. You all have classes, right? This is like like a school day. <laughs> I'm wondering where, where you think so children who are adopted, foreign children who are adopted by American parents, but their yes. parents fail to properly naturalize them, where do they fall? Um, well, I, I almost feel that that is, um, at least in ethnic studies and in Asian American studies, it's becoming its own separate genre. So I think uh, uh, what you're alluding to is adoption, right? So an international adoption. And uh, at the height of that, right, something on the order of five to 10,000 children from Asia were being adopted into predominantly middle class Christian white families in the United States between 1970 and 1990. This is a lot of, a lot of kids, yeah. That uh, group of, of young people, that is its own kind of genre. I think many of them have experiences that reflect or that maybe mirror some of these experiences. But the one thing that they don't really struggle with is a legal problem. You know what I mean? Uh, if they were properly adopted, they literally are the children of their white parents. They don't necessarily have problems getting a driver's license, problems going to college, those kinds of issues. Yeah. 
So uh, relatively early on, uh, I did not really uh, focus on that. I'm really just looking at children and young adults uh, who have to cope with, in the very formative years of their lives, with a very considerable legal problem, right? And a uh, legal status problem, yeah, and what that sort of looks like. I have, oh, I have a question. Um, so I was wondering if you had done any research into mixed race children who are like the product of interracial, like consensual interracial relationships, and given that kind of added uh, illegal status on top uh -huh. of like an illegal immigrant status? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I am very much thinking that I should probably add that. Uh, yeah. because, a lot, you know, because a lot of fugitive uh, slaves who come to the North, especially uh, ones who pass as white, they often take white spouses. Right. And so their children are, um, well, I mean, what are they? In terms of uh, their legal status, they still might be slaves. They sort of look white. Right? Uh, again, the status problem is ambiguous, sort of uncertain. But I think they are a significant population of African Americans in the North. Yeah. And then you see that as well in Asian American history, where Asian Americans who are illegal immigrants uh, often did, uh, especially among Filipinos, they attempted to marry white uh, spouses, and so they had biracial children who often had this kind of problem. Uh, at least in this project, I have not treated them as a distinct category or group, uh, largely because I don't know that the sample was very large. Can I ask you, though, like what your hypothesis would be as to like identity formation, like kind of given that overlap? You know, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> In, in archival history, unless you have some solid evidence, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it'd be very into, hey, you're all young. You should do archival work and find that out, right? I mean, uh, you're all relying on me. Right? Oh, I think that's a good one. <laughs>